Hello, welcome to Between the Covers. I'm your host, Bethany Grabo. Today's guest is author John Corey Whaley. Corey is the author of Where Things Came Back, winner of the 2012 Prince Award for Excellence in Young Adult Literature, and Noggin, a 2014 National Book Award finalist. His new book, Highly Illogical Behavior, is out this month. John Corey Whaley, welcome to Between the Covers. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Today we're talking about your newest book, Highly Illogical Behavior, that BuzzFeed calls another raw, funny, and unforgettable read from Whaley that won't leave you disappointed. Could you give us a summary of the book? Sure, yeah. Um, Highly Illogical Behavior was my book about anxiety. And so I wanted to write about my misunderstanding of my own anxiety and other people's misunderstanding about it. And so it's about a kid named Solomon Reed. He's 16 years old. He hasn't left his home in over three years. And that's because his severe panic attacks were just making the world too overwhelming for him. And because he hasn't left his home in so long, he has no friends. His support system is his parents, his grandmother. And when the book begins, Lisa Prater, a girl who remembers his last day at middle school when he had a panic attack in front of the school, stripped down to his boxers and jumped into the school fountain. She remembers this all these years later and finds a way to insert herself into Solomon's very small world. And she does not have the best of intentions. At first, she is intending to get her personal experience with mental illness so that she can write this killer essay and get into this psychiatry psychology program at a at a university and sort of change her life. As you mentioned, the main character Solomon hasn't left the house in over three years due to an anxiety disorder. Why did you decide to write about anxiety and mental illness? Yeah, well I have um, pretty bad anxiety disorder. I control it now with medication and therapy, but at the time when I was touring with my second book Noggin, I was just in this really heightened state of anxiety. I was having frequent panic attacks. It was sending me into these depressive episodes and I realized a lot about what I didn't understand about what was happening to me. And then I definitely realized how other people were responding to my behavior and how confusing mental illness really is and how I think that's probably why it's so easy to stigmatize even in 2016. And so I threw away the book that I was working on and I decided to write this story instead. And Solomon is, of course in a much more severe case of anxiety than I've ever been in because he's fully fledged agoraphobic in this story. But that is all something that builds up after years and years of, of an anxiety disorder. So it was honestly and selfishly, I wrote it for me first. I, I needed this story. I needed to figure out more about my mental illness and mental illness in general. And so sort of diving into it was this Really, the only way I knew how, sort of like with my other books, the only way I knew how to understand what I was going through better is to write about it. And so I would, this is what happened. Interesting. And like you said, Solomon's is an extreme case, but this is a serious issue that you're writing about, and you want to give him a problem, but you also want to humanize the issue. So did you do any other kinds of research to make sure his experience was authentic? I did. You know, I did... I did a good amount of supplemental research on mental illness, on anxiety, on agoraphobia, which is really classified as a separate diagnosis now than, than anxiety disorder. But they're, very, they're still very closely related as far as I understand. But I will say sometimes, and especially with this book, what I realize is the more sort of in-depth research I do, it starts to become less personal. And so then I have to remind myself to go back to the human part of the story first and then let everything else be secondary. So although it is a story that has a lot to do with mental illness, it has more to do with the character who happens to have mental illness. And so because it, it was sparked by such a personal thing, I often found myself steering back to what I knew personally. But for instance, I decided I would read about typical or, you know, the average feeling of a panic disorder, I'm sorry, of a panic attack from someone who suffers from anxiety disorder. And what I started realizing after reading them is I was focusing too much on the similarities, on the things that were different between people who have panic attacks. 
and really just realized that the best, most authentic and realistic way for my character was to just go back to the way that I have experienced them in the past. And so there's this area where I definitely wanted to have my facts straight and not misrepresent anything, but I also wanted this to be a story not about a more broad understanding of mental illness, but about the very individual personal nature of it and how it is person by person and not diagnosis by diagnosis, Mm -hmm. you know. I read an article not too long ago and they were talking about how kids who read fiction are more empathetic because even if they're not experiencing that particular thing in their own lives, they're reading about it and thinking about how someone would feel if they were in that situation. They're able to apply that to, you know, put themselves in other people's shoes. So it sounds like that's kind of what you're going for here. Too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm trying. I, at the same time, I'm a fiction writer. I want it to be entertaining. I want it to be, you know, I want these characters to seem like my readers' friends at the end of the day. But there is that thing, you know, they've been doing a lot of research recently about how different types of literature teaches empathy and literary fiction is the one that teaches it the best it seems and I think that's just really fascinating and it's really to me it's inspiring because well a I get to be part of it or at least try to be part of it as long as they let me and b it's comforting to know that all of this make-believe actually does mean something Mm -hmm. you know Mm mm-hmm I'm a children's librarian, so that's always yeah. <laughs> something. Sometimes you have to convince the parents, like, they don't always need to be reading textbooks or these really exactly. you know, dense informational things. This is also yeah. valuable. <laughs> it's about learning to be human better, you know, and, yeah. and, and how, what better way than to experience other kinds of humanity, you know. And, and, and a book to so many people is so personal, and it's not something that you finish in an hour and a half like a movie. It's not something you watch in half an hour like a TV show. You you live inside of this book for for just a little bit. And that makes you, I think, just naturally empathetic to whoever you're reading about. How could it not? Definitely. You know? All right. I could talk about books and kids all day, but yeah. uh, <laughs> Me go too. back to the <laughs> go back to the book here. So one of the characters, Lisa, like you mentioned, uh, wants to be a psychologist and sets out to use her knowledge to, quote unquote, fix Solomon. So why did you write her that way? Have you known Lisa's in your life? You know, I don't know that I've known specific Lisa's. I've definitely, I've definitely felt a little bit of what Lisa feels in the story where I have been so sure that what I feel or think or know is what would be best for someone else if they would just listen to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think I wanted to explore a little bit of that part of my own personality through Lisa. And also, I've always just been really fascinated with ambition, with the positives and negatives of ambition, and how there's a very fine line between being ambitious and being overly ambitious, and uh, or aggressively or offensively ambitious. And so Lisa sort of just came from this place of, I needed an outsider, but I needed an outsider who so badly wanted to be an insider in the story and to show what she would do. And also it's that gray area of, and I've definitely experienced this, of someone deciding to do something that is potentially or obviously very wrong but they've convinced themselves that it's okay if everyone wins in the end. Mm. But, you know, I think, I think Lisa in the book, I think she definitely finds some redemption depending on how you read it. And she was just a really fascinating, interesting character for me to write because she was so different from my usual characters because of her sort of strong will and definitely her, um, her need to sort of control a situation that she really doesn't have a right to try to control at all. And as a control freak, I think that was important for me to write about. (laughs) We've all been there. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I want to talk more about Lisa. Her character is a model student. She's very driven. She's highly motivated to leave her hometown. Her boyfriend, Clark, is the opposite. He's more laid back. He's in no hurry to map out his future or to leave town. It seems like the teen eager to escape the confines of their hometown is common among young adult literature. Can you talk about the choices you made when writing the characters with these motivations? 
Yeah, I mean, my entire first book, Where Things Come Back, is about trying to get out of your hometown and the struggle of finding yourself in a place that makes it so impossible to figure out your own identity. And so with Lisa, I think there's a little bit of that, you know, still in me that I need to explore as a writer, as a person. And I mean, I'm pretty frank when I say that, and and have been for the last five years with these three books and touring with them, this is just the best freest form of therapy I can find is writing these books. And a lot of it is trying to figure out those different facets of my personality, of the things that I tend to begrudge or misunderstand or confuse in the past. And getting to work through those things through fictional characters is, at least to me, this powerful, unique experience. You know, I when I wrote Where Things Come Back, my first book, and then I went back to my hometown after writing it, after it was published, after people there read it, then I started looking at the place differently. I looked at it as a place not that, you know, gave me so much pain and confusion that I had to run away, but instead a place that had, for whatever reason, inspired this story. And so a lot of a lot of writing about characters who struggle with where they're from and getting from one place to another or getting to a life that they believe they are supposed to or destined to to, you know, live, I think a lot of that is about how long it took me to really branch out. You know, I was 30 years old before I moved away from Louisiana, and that was just two, almost three years ago. You know, Mm -hmm. I was 29, maybe. (laughs) So you're from a small town? I am from a very small town of about six or 7,000 people. It's called Spring Hill, Louisiana. It's right on the Arkansas state line. People always ask me, Oh, well, didn't you have fun going to New Orleans? Well, that's a six and a half hour drive. So I've been there three times. I'm from the part of Louisiana that's much more like East Texas, which is just trees and fields and farmland and the appropriate um, people <laughs> that are involved in those places. Which, which yes. look, you mm-hmm. know, I, I like being from a small town as an adult. I think it gave me an interesting perspective on the world. I definitely think I can get along with any kind of person being from where I'm from, sometimes better in person than sort of on social media because it's easy to be such a jerk on there (laughs) from both sides, myself included. But I, I don't, I no longer begrudge where I'm from because I think, well, I read this thing one time that any good writer struggles with where he or she is from and I definitely do, because these little things pop up in every single thing I write. (laughs) So So I have to ask, is either of these characters, Lisa or Clark or maybe Solomon, like you in high school? You know, no, actually. Lisa would probably be the closest to me in high school. Clark, you know, Clark is this surprisingly sensitive and nerdy jock who doesn't really like the sort of stereotypical role he's found himself in as a high schooler. Solomon is debilitated by his fear of the world. And I was really neither of those. I was much more Lisa. I I wanted to do well. I wanted to get away. I I needed as much control as I could get. The dissimilarity between Lisa and myself would be that she doesn't have a good parental situation. And my parents were very much the parents who inspired Solomon's. You know, I had very open-minded, progressive, supportive parents growing up. So, you know, I was Lisa with really good parents. It wasn't about escaping them. It was about escaping what I thought was a place that didn't offer the opportunities I wanted. That's really what drives her most is that she doesn't feel like Upland, California is somewhere she can be the Lisa Prater she's supposed to be, mm-hmm. you know? And I can remember feeling, like, very um, disheartened that I, of all places to be born, I was born in Spring Hill, Louisiana, and it took a long time to grow out of that. So I'm definitely Lisa. Okay. You know, I've had to come to terms with that. <laughs> well, you brought up something that I wanted to talk about. 
So another common plot device in young adult literature is the absentee parent mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in highly illogical behavior. And in fact, in all of your books, I'd argue the exact opposite is true. Solomon's parents and grandma are extremely supportive. Why did you decide to write them this way instead of following the common formula? You know, it, I wish I had a, a better answer than just I wrote what I know and I had really amazing supportive parents in a place where a lot of my friends didn't in a place where it would have been easy to be a sort of aggressively liberal closeted kid in a small Louisiana town and be really um, isolated from my family because of that but I wasn't I was always supported and when I said I wanted, I wanted to be a writer, you know, it wasn't about, you can't do that, that's impossible. It was about, well, maybe have a backup plan, but please try, you know. <laughs> so I taught school for five years. And it's important to me that my teen readers understand that sometimes your parents can be there for you and they can be really good at it because a lot of people have really good parents. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not sort of my statement again about I think young adult literature shows too many absent parents or anything like that. It really, I I don't pay attention to that stuff very closely, honestly. But I've been really happy that it's gotten a positive response and that a lot of teenagers have told me I really liked that the parents were good in this and that Mm -hmm. they were there because my parents are there and I don't feel like they get the credit. And so honestly, it's one of those things that's, personal to me. And and I'm also fascinated with the parental relationships with children, especially children struggling through these uniquely strange situations like in all three of my books. And so I can even remember in my first book wanting to have there be some sort of struggle in the in the marriage because of a missing child and realizing that I didn't want to go there, mm-hmm. that I that I didn't want to go there. I still want, I wanted them staying together to be the stronger message for the character and the family and stuff. So I can mostly chalk it up to that whole write what you know thing. And I know good parents because <laughs> I had them. So, and a lot of kids do. And I hate that what I'm finding out is that maybe that's underrepresented. Mm-hmm. And so it's nice to know that if anything, uh, a kid can read this and say, maybe I can talk to my parents about this kind of stuff. Maybe they are ready for this. Or maybe talking to them will force them to be ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope I'm not giving away too much in saying that Solomon is gay. No, no, no. And why did you decide to make this a dimension of his character? Well, you know, I've never had an openly gay main protagonist before. In Noggin, I had the best friend Kyle, but his whole situation was he came out to the character before this character, quote unquote, dies. And then five years later, when this character sort of comes back to life, uh, he realizes his best friend is still in the closet. And it becomes this sort of source of, well, it just becomes one of the main character Travis's missions is to, I need to make sure he knows he can be himself. And in that sense, Travis showed a little bit of his Lisa Prater side, even in that story, where he felt like it was his role to sort of control this person's coming out, which it was not. And a, and a lot of people really hate that about that character, but I like it about him. And with this one, first of all, I wanted to, as a gay man, I wanted to make sure that when I did decide to devote an entire novel to a gay character, that I did it the right way, that I didn't do it in a way that pigeonholed me into having to, you know, oh, now Corey Whaley writes the gay coming out issue books, and that's going to be his thing. Mm-hmm. And Because I do think it's easy to pigeonhole yourself in books. And what I'm trying to do with my career is everything I write, I want to be completely different from the last thing I wrote. Or, you know, themes and tones can be similar, but situations and really just character study-wise, I want it to be really unique, each one. And so when it came to approaching Solomon's sexuality, I wanted it to be discussed almost like you would discuss heterosexuality, where it's not the focal point of the story. It's not a coming out story. Does he come out in the story to a few people? Yes. But... 
in showing how casual it's received by every single person, I wanted to, in that way, make his homosexuality something that was just normal to mm-hmm. all of these people in the story. And, and the hope there is that a kid living in rural Louisiana where coming out is still probably pretty scary, I couldn't do it when I lived there. Don't know if I could now if I still live there as a kid. Hopefully in reading something like that and in seeing the casual nature that him being gay is treated by not just his new friends but his family members, that that can be something of a of a inspiring nature to a young reader or an old reader, you mm-hmm. know? So I also liked the idea that Solomon measures his worth based on his mental illness. And so that he has this conversation with Lisa when he does come out to her and she says, have you not told your parents? And he kind of suggests, well, what would be the point? If I'm never going to leave the house, why does it matter mm-hmm. if I'm gay or straight? Why would that matter? And I think that that's something just about identity that I wanted to kind of explore. And I found it really interesting to explore that through Solomon in his particular situation. So. And I think you kind of talked about this a little bit, but... Ten years ago, a character being gay would have been the centerpiece of the book, but now it's just another character trait. So as a writer of young adult fiction, how do you think the greater cultural acceptance of the LGBT community has changed how you write your characters? Gosh, um, that's a hard question. Yeah. Um, You know, the thing is, I can remember just five years ago being hesitant to write a main gay character because I didn't... My coming out was boring. I told my family and friends. They all said, okay. I didn't have a struggle with it. My only struggle was internal and how long I decided to wait. And so a lot of it is about, I try to write from as realistic a place as possible. And if it's something I don't know about, at least a little bit personally, then I feel like I'll do a disservice to it. So it was never my intention to write a coming out story because I don't feel like I have a unique one to tell. And that's not meaning that, look, I'm a fiction writer, and it's not meaning that I couldn't just make one up. But because my stories usually come from a, at least the seed of something very personal, and I think that's what keeps them grounded in this sort of reality that I'm going for, I I just wanted to make sure I, I did it right. And when it came to approaching the third book, I realized, well, this may be the opportunity to have a protagonist who is gay, and this is not at all what anyone is going to care about when they read this book. Mm-hmm. And and so far, that's exactly what's happened. This story is so much about being human first and then everything else second, and being a person and how individual mental illness is, how individual every experience is, and how we all very personally drink in the world and and accept it in different ways and understand it in different ways. And so that was sort of the reason why I thought it was the time. Yeah, and I think it's good to have people who are reading it say, well, it could go like this, or it could it could just Certainly. not be a, good, a big deal. So. Certainly. Well, what I wanted is readers to look back and realize that they could interchange Solomon or Clark or Lisa, with any gender they wanted to, with any sexuality they wanted to, and it wouldn't really change the meaning of the story. Mm-hmm. And that's how I think all characters should be looked at. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want every book about a gay kid to be about how hard it is to be gay, because I find it really easy to be gay, and I want other people to know that. It's really easy to be yourself when you decide that you should be honest about it. Mm-hmm. And that a lot of people have a support system that's already there waiting on them, and maybe they don't know it. And that's why there's no shame attached to his homosexuality at all in the story. And looking back, that's something that I'm glad I waited, because I think with this particular story about the individual nature of mental illness and the individual nature of just personality, I think it worked. I think it worked for this one. You kind of mentioned this as well. This book and your other books feature extremely close friendships, like people hanging out every single day. Uh, Why do you make friendship the centerpiece of your stories? I can remember being a kid and thinking, I don't understand friends. (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't understand this voluntary hangout thing. I, I can remember, you know, my best friend growing up was just my mom's best friend's son who happened to be a year younger than I was. So we were just always in the same place. And then you get this certain age where you realize you can start making your own decisions and then you never speak to each other again. And it's not about anything bad. It's just like friends by default is sort of how it felt. And then I can remember going to college and just out of my own anxiety, out of my own sort of shyness and being somewhere where I didn't really know anyone, I really shut myself off to making new friends and things like that. And I think in having a lot of, as I've grown up, in really realizing how important close friendships are, one or two people who you can be your exact and full self around and what that means and has meant to me and hopefully to them. I think that sort of is when I started to realize the importance of friendship and that it's not about collecting this many friends or that many friends. It's about finding your club. It's about finding your people that you that speak to you and you speak to them and you speak the same language. And for whatever reason, it just is fun and interesting to write about. You know, in my first book, I I wrote Gabriel is the younger brother, but he's more like a friend to the main character. And then I wrote this other character who is a friend who's more like a brother. And I think a lot of it just comes down to almost like I explore friendships in the way that I sort of always wanted them, but also in the way that I wanted my sibling relationships to be. I had an older brother. We weren't very close. We're still not very close. And I had a sister who was 15 years older who lived in a different state, so I couldn't really have that day-to-day -day interaction. So if you really just look at all the friendships that I write about, they, they're they very similar to just close siblings more than anything. And I think it's just more of me working out the therapy things I need yeah. when I write these books. <laughs> and these are the friends you want or you wish you had or you wish you could have totally. back then. Yeah. I mean, the greatest thing about fiction is getting to create scenarios that you always wanted, but you get to create it for these characters who, look, these characters are all very different from me, but they all come from my brain. And mm -hmm. inevitably, they're going to have aspects of my personality and my understanding of the world hopefully from different and nuanced perspectives, um, if I'm doing my job correctly. But it's just about being able to insert characters into these situations that I can remember being a kid and really thinking about and really wondering about, you know? I can remember wondering, what's it like to have a friend that comes and stays over a couple of nights a week? I don't have a friend like that, and things like that. And so... Getting to do that through fiction and through these characters has helped me personally understand the nature of friendship better and I think has made me be a better friend in my actual life. Because when you have to write those relationships and devote that amount of time to really figuring out how people are and what they reveal about each other when they're that close, then I think naturally you just become that way or at least try to emulate a little bit of your characterization or what yeah. have you. So part of the friendship revolves around Star Trek, the next generation references <laughs> in this book. So true. out of all the pop culture references, what made you decide on Star Trek? You know, it's interesting. I am a pretty bad Trekkie, actually, um, which is shameful. But I was a huge Star Trek, the next generation fan when I was in middle school. And I had all the action figures I pretended my mother's bar stools were the Starship Enterprise. I don't know why. It was just a lot of layers I could pretend was a spaceship or something. And when I when it came to writing this book, my first thought was, oh no, I've decided to write about an agoraphobic. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? <laughs> yeah, He's going to sit in the house <laughs> all the time? How in the world is anyone going to read this book about someone who never leaves? It's hard enough to write a book about anything, but when you have to write one isolated to one particular home and 75% and or 80% of this book is, then it really became about giving him interest and giving him an obsession. And then when I figured out that giving him this very particular sort of for his age and for the 
2015 when I wrote the book, giving him this obsession with a 90s science fiction um, soap opera, basically, was a good way to not only connect him to a character like Clark, who sort of is this secret sci-fi nerd as well, but also I started thinking a lot about Star Trek The Next Generation and what the whole point of it is. And I can remember doing some research and reading about it and reading about a bunch of episodes, watching some episodes on Netflix. And that whole idea that it's this, and and by the way, greatest thing ever that I get to talk about Star Trek all the time. (laughs) I don't know how I've done this in my career, so it's fantastic. But anyway, that's mostly why I did it, so I could talk about it. But the show is about going out into these crews of people going out into the world not to understand other people better, not to conquer things, not to fight things or save things, but to look outward so that they can learn more about humanity. And it just immediately clicked with me when I when I sort of thought of it that this is exactly what Solomon can't do and that his problem with humanity is that he can't go out and he, and his problem with his own identity may stem from the fact that the world is too big and chaotic for him and that until he's able to branch out and explore the world, then maybe he'll never fully understand humanity in that way. And so when it became this sort of strange, larger parallel, a reverse parallel to his situation, it just seemed to fit. It just seemed to fit. And then And then you have the character Data, who just wants to know what it's like to be a human. He just wants to know what real emotion is and understand as much as he can about real people or real life forms in general. It just all seemed to fit. It just all seemed to fit. So I I was really afraid I would have to cut it all and everyone would hate it and my (laughs) editor would hate it. No. But my editor's husband actually became my Star Trek guru during the writing. So I would send little suggestions to him and he wouldn't really know what I was writing about or anything, but he would sort of steer me in some good episodic realms that I could explore and watch and study. And um, it really helped a lot. Star Trek allegory for real life. I like it. I mean, why not? (laughs) Why not? So along those lines, it seems like young adult fiction is the go-to resource for Hollywood these days. They're making young adult books into movies Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. every single week, it seems like. Why do you think that is? I mean, I hope it's because there's a ton of people reading these books. You know, the last I heard, young adult fiction is one of the best-selling genres of, of books out there. And... I think, honestly, I mean, you know, I can't speak for Hollywood, but what I can say is Hollywood goes where the money is, and they're trying to go where the money is. Mm-hmm. That's the most technical businessy side of it. I can tell you Noggin's been in the works for quite a bit of time, mm-hmm. the Noggin film. I, yeah, I'm, I'm an executive producer, which doesn't mean anything, but I, I have a great screenwriter. He's working on a draft of it now that hopefully will work out. I have the same producers as Fault in Our Stars and Paper Towns and mm-hmm. everything like that. And so it's it's exciting, but look, it's also about that fear that, well, what if this is just a two or three year trend and then it's going to be back to something else or they're going to go to dystopian novels again instead of realistic oh, contemporary <laughs> YA. Yeah, you and me both. And um, I don't know. I think... What I hope is that Hollywood is responding to how personally and enthusiastically not just teenagers but adults are embracing these stories, a lot of which I think are really personal stories about growing up and understanding yourself. The best example and my favorite young adult film and one of my favorite young adult books is Me and Earl and the Dying Girl by Jesse Andrews. And the fact that you have an amazing novelist who turned his amazing novel, into such a great movie and one that tells... It doesn't tell a story that's tied in a nice fancy bow at the end. It doesn't give audiences every little warm, fuzzy thing they need. It's realistic, like a lot of these books that I think are gaining popularity with people and with a lot of adults. And so I hope that it's just Hollywood embracing that. I'm sure it's mostly about money. 
Because <laughs> that's Hollywood. And I can say that just because I live in L.A. And <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I didn't know that about Nog, and that's really exciting. I'm um, excited. Which actors would you choose to play the main characters in highly illogical behavior? Gosh, you know, I haven't really thought about this a lot. Um, and I'm feeling really old lately because, like, the idea of thinking about who, who, what young actors are there to play teenagers, I don't know any of them. I really like the kid from, and I like him for Noggin, too. I like the kid from Jurassic Park, the one who played the older teenager. I'm His name is Nick Robinson. Okay. Um <laughs> Because he was in this really great movie called Kings of Summer a few years back. And it was great. It was a really great sort of coming of age movie. I don't know. I don't know about Lisa. Who knows? If I could take, if I could just superimpose Reese Witherspoon from the film Election as Tracy Flick to be Lisa, that would be perfect. But Reese Witherspoon is sadly far too old to play (laughs) um, a teenage girl anymore. But um, I don't know. That's tough. That's a tough one. Can I tell you, I, I hope you don't find this insulting, but I as I'm picturing Clark, I'm totally thinking Freddie Prince Jr. Freddie Prince Jr., okay. <laughs> Since you made a 90s reference earlier. That's... Okay, okay. Well, we'd have to get the time machine for yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's probably a little... He's got gray hair now, Freddie Prince Jr. Oh, man. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what I was picturing, kind of the, the sensitive jock. I'll take it. I'll okay. take it. Okay. I, he was great and She's All That. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't want to It's a great movie. Like, <gasps> it's a great movie. <laughs> okay. All right. I do want to bring up Noggin a little more because mm-hmm. our listeners might not know it, but it was really interesting. Basically, it's about a teenage boy who has a terminal illness and agrees to participate in an experimental procedure in which his head is cryogenically frozen and reanimated later on a different person's body. So it was a super interesting premise, and I'm just wondering, how did you come up with that idea? Well, I was desperate for a book idea. I'd thrown away a book I'd written twice that I was just sure would be my second book. And it just wasn't working. It wasn't working. I knew it wasn't working. My editor knew it wasn't working. And so I decided, okay, well, I need to go by that thing that someone, that a lot of people have told me that, you know, write the book you've always wanted to read. I'm like, okay, well, I can start there. But that didn't really get me very far. So then I decided, well, what what do I like to read? What are my favorite things to read? And I thought, I was thinking a lot about Vonnegut at the time. And I'm a huge Kurt Vonnegut fan. I have So It Goes tattooed on my arm. And Slaughterhouse-Five is one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book of all time. And then I decided to just break it down. Why do I like Kurt Vonnegut so much? Why do his books appeal to me? And then it became more, it became obvious that it was the blend of emotional reality with absurdity. You know, make me laugh till I'm crying on one page and then bring it home and make me weep on the next page because of something actually realistically sad. And... Honestly, at first, it was just a challenge to myself. I said, try to be like Vonnegut. Try to come up with an absurd, ridiculous idea that will get you laughed out of a room the second you pitch it and then prove that you can make it work. And then Noggin happened. Uh, A little of it was a wink to Slaughterhouse-Five where he is a little bit out of time. He comes back five years later. Everyone is five years older, including his girlfriend who he's very much in love with. And to him, it feels like he took a nap. Like he closed his eyes, opened them, and it was five years later, and he had a new body. Mm -hmm. And the punchline is that he didn't think he would live. He thought he was just signing on for this because it was time to let go. Because how could that work, you Mm -hmm. know? But it did, and the technology was much faster than, than he or anyone anticipated. So it was about being out of time with people, out of sync with people, and out of sync with your friends and your family and with your life. And so what what on the surface looks like a science fiction novel is actually a realistic fiction novel about relationships mm-hmm. and about the fight to make your life what it maybe can't be anymore and make your relationships maybe what they can't be anymore and how to grow up and move on from those things. And so that's how Nagin happened. Um, I can't pinpoint the moment I decided to chop his head off and freeze it, but uh, 
I can tell you that Vonnegut was a heavy influence because it was that the idea that I could take a seemingly stupid idea and then ground it in emotion and ground it in a real story that people could apply to their lives. It just seemed fun. It seemed fun and risky enough to push me in the right direction creatively. And luckily it worked out, I think. Well, I've noticed in your books that although the premises may be big, like in Noggin, where the main character literally waking from the dead, um, you still like to keep the stories more or less small, contained within the intimate interactions of a few characters. So the world's not in peril, lives aren't at stake. They're really boiled down to very personal relationships and the emotional, the emotions involved with their actions and circumstances. Why do you choose to focus on what many writers ignore or is often overlooked? Um, you know, my editor and I talk a lot about this. We talk about starting broadly and then, and then sort of zooming in as far as we can zoom on a personal level with our characters. And really, it's about for my personal writing style for the. For the way that I create characters and stories, it seems that I can say more with less. It mm -hmm. seems that I can say more about something I want to explore, be it medical ethics, be it mental illness, be it the dangers of um, misinterpreting religion and faith, like in my first book. But honing in on a personal story is the way to make that personal connection with my readers first. And to make that the most important thing, because if we're going back to that fiction, literary fiction, teaching empathy, then it's it's my it's my understanding that it needs to feel as personal to my reader as it feels to me when I'm writing it. And that's the way that you get that empathy. That's the way that you get that understanding. When I've tried to write things on a broader scale about these topics, when I've started a lot of the drafts, a lot of the first drafts of these three books have been bigger with higher stakes, what happens is it becomes heavy handed. It becomes, you can see the author's vendetta. You can see the preachiness. You can see what I want you to feel. And instead, I want you to feel it without you seeing what you're feeling. I want you to feel it through the characters. I want you to feel it through the personal relationships and connections that are made. And and then I look back at all of my favorite things, and they're not these grand, huge things that are supposed to make this big statement. It's the little personal moments and stories that have the greatest impact. And so... It's just a it's just a personal preference. It's it's the way that I feel like my writing can serve my readers the best. Is is starting starting with the smallest, most intimate personal part of a story and then hoping that that creates some sort of outward understanding um as far as what I'm writing about. If you could go back in time and give your high school self one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, to, to just be myself, to be myself every day and be unapologetic about it, not to, not to hide any aspect of who I was. You know, I was so worried about being found out that I was the gay kid in class, that I would make my voice sound different. Or I remember going home sometimes just feeling sick to my stomach because maybe I said something that sounded gay or girly. And I remember suppressing my mannerisms because that didn't seem masculine enough. And, and now as an adult, I realize how stupid and all that is and how it doesn't matter who it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I, that's what I want to say. I want to go back and say the people who don't like you for who you are will never matter. So just remember that. They can go and like whatever they want, but it doesn't matter to who you are and who you'll become or your character. And and I think it's really, that's a lot easier said than done. But if I could go back in time and tell that to my myself, I would say these people should be so lucky <laughs> to be around someone who can be honest and be themselves and be unapologetic about it. And to some degree... You know, I remember being the only sort of liberal kid in my entire school. I remember getting in huge arguments with everyone during the Bush-Gore election when I was a junior in high school. My entire history class just 
yelling at me because I, you know, thought George W. Bush was the devil. But, you know, time time reveals truths <laughs> and I was right. So that's really all that matters. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, there's a there's like an entire country that agrees with me now. So. And now you're in Portland. So and there you you're go. In, you're in good hands. There you go. <laughs> You have a website at johncoreywhaley.com, which, unlike many other authors' websites, is up to date. So high five on that. Thank you. I try <laughs> very hard to keep that thing updated. <laughs> Are there other ways readers can discover more about you and your work? Yeah, I'm always on Twitter. I can't promise not to that I'm not political on there sometimes, but, you know, we all have our ways. It's Corey underscore Whaley, and I have a Facebook page. You can find me on there. Just search John Corey Whaley. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty easy to get to. There's even an email address on my website, so readers and fans can write me, and I have made it my vow to answer every single one, no matter how many I get. I'm not famous enough yet for it to be a problem, <laughs> but if anyone ever sees it written from an assistant, it's just me pretending to be my assistant. <laughs> All right, all you KB listeners out there, you heard it here first. <laughs> I appreciate you talking to me. Before we wrap things up, is there anything else you'd like to tell listeners about your book, Highly Illogical Behavior? All I'll say is it's easy to peg the book as a book about mental illness. But my hope is that when you read it, you realize that it's about relationships. It's about friendship. It's about growing up. And more so than anything, it's about how difficult it is sometimes to learn to be yourself and to be yourself unapologetically and to be transparent with everyone in your life who you care about the most. And so that's that's sort of what I wanted to do with this book. And I just hope people enjoy it. Well, John Corey Whaley, thank you so much for talking with me today on Between the Covers. Thank you so much. I had a blast. Thank you for joining us today on Between the Covers. I'm your host, Bethany Grabo.